third world foreign exchange. Right. Seth Gaines. Trinity. Boy, where I'm from, the slums is beautiful. Dirt roads, potholes, bare back suitable. Dating by the stand pipes, galvanized roof, yo. So if you don't give a fuck, the feeling is mutual. Musical, magical, my block for real. At what point did you decide to start uh, your clothing line and um, what sort of the motivated um, your uh, idea? to make the cultural connection. Okay, so to, to, get, to go back to the beginning, um, my friend, he's passed on now. He was a rapper from Trinidad. His rap name was Seth Gaines. And so he's the original founding member of Third World Famous, right? And, um, mm -hmm. you know, what happened was that when we were doing some of our first videos, rap videos in like about 2006, 2007, we created some tees like um, Trinidad as one of our most popular designs um, to as promotional tools for the video. So we were all wearing, you know, the, um, the tees in the video and whatnot. And, you know, fast forward from that time till about 2013, I was looking back at some of our videos and I said, you know, I think the tees are fire. Like, I feel like they can stand alone because when we did the video, a lot of people were saying, oh, I love the Trinidad. I love, you know, the different yeah. design. And, I mean, I was always into fashion. And I was like, you know what? This could be an opportunity to kind of run with something that we already kind of established in a way. And so about 2013, 2014, I did my first run of my Trinidad um, design and the third world famous logo. And um, yeah, people, you know, People love them. They really love them, and it kind of and it kind of took off, you know. Yeah. And so, you know, based on my research, you know, I was seeing people saying that you know the brands that last the longest, so have the most longevity, are the ones that tell the best story. Mm. So you have to know what is your brand about, right? And kind of be hyper focused on that. And you know, our name kind of just stares us in the direction already, right? Third world famous. What's famous in the third world, right? And so there are many things. And I think, you know, the real point is that the majority of the planet lives in a third world country. It's not really the other way around. You know what I mean? Like if you, you know, India and China, the most populous nations on earth, for sure, they're third world, right? So, you know, when you just think about it from that perspective, the majority of people share... Um, a similar lifestyle as opposed to the other, like, you know, United States, milk and land of milk and honey. It's not really like that um, everywhere else. So I feel like even within sharing, if I shared my specific Trinidad experience, it wouldn't be the exact same as somebody from South Africa or Gambia, but we would have a lot more similar um, traits than, say, somebody who's grown up in the Netherlands, Right. And so I feel like I was like, wow, you know, within telling um, the story from my perspective, I'm probably I'm going to be able to include a lot of people across the planet's ex um, um, experience, right, or perspective. Mm -hmm. And so that was sort of the um, that was sort of the genesis for um, making those connections. And then the more research that I do on other countries. You know, it's just more fascinating to me. And then I see more connections. I'm like, oh, okay, I get it. They don't want us to know that. Oh, yeah, yes. yeah. They're not telling that story because they don't. Information is the power, right? And, you know, even though we have internet and more access to information, it doesn't mean you're getting the right information, right? There's disinformation out there. And then, two, it doesn't mean people are interested to actually look it up anyway. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that is the part where I come in. So, you know, if... Like, uh, I, th I know you caught the, 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 um, the end of our Maroons room that we did on Clubhouse. But yes, that was an amazing room. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, you know, a lot of people reached out to me after. People from the Caribbean and said, I never even heard of the Maroons. So, you know, it's our culture, right? It's our culture. It's literally our history, but they're not teaching it to you in schools. You know, traditionally, African people use oral... Um, they tell their history orally. So if the elders aren't telling you, then you don't know it. 
That's so it's just kind of, it can get lost. Uh, you can, or you can never find it, I should say, if you don't, if there isn't some deliberate effort. So I feel like I'm bridging the gap right now. Yes. Of course, mm -hmm. I'm trying to do them. I'm trying to make the designs cool for people to wear. If they're willing, if they think it's cool, and then they might gravitate towards the history part after, right? So the aesthetic <laughs> has to be there first. Yeah, and you know, that's the, um, the, the thing that stuck out to me about your brand mm -hmm. that really um, I absolutely love because, you know, there are lots of uh, people, some of which who may be, uh, who may be viewing uh, this video, um, but I've met so many different people who sell shirts. Um, I met so many people who say they have a clothing line and or who want to advance their clothing line. And one of the biggest things I find um, that's so critical that you just highlighted um, is, the, is the story behind it. I like the shirt that you have on, that is really what moved me to buy that shirt because it's the story behind it. Yeah, it's like amazingly beautiful, mm -hmm. but I really connected with the message and the history. Can you tell people about this shirt that you have on uh -huh. that I'm so happy I bought? <laughs> uh, yeah, um, yes. uh, thank you for supporting. So it's the it's called the original maroon five right now we know about the band the maroon five right and yeah. nothing against those guys you know i i like is it adam levine is his name i think he's oh, a dope wow. artist yeah you know the maroon five you know they're a white band right so there is so put in the word the original there is a little play on the fact that like okay you know white people have the kind of run of the mill now you know the world is like a white has a white standard but in case you didn't know, before, the, um, you know, Black people ran a lot of things, right? We are the original people, right? That's so right. We, we invented thinking. That's what I always tell people when they, you know, don't know how to place themselves in the world as a Black person. Just remember, you're the first person to invent thought, your ancestors, uh -huh. right? So, Amazing. you know, so, um, so yeah, so this design is... Um, the maroon five, the maroons are, um, it's a play off the word cimarron, which is a Spanish word for wild, ruly, and tame. That's the word that the colonizers used um, to, uh, for us, right? And um, so the maroon, the maroons were basically runaway African slaves or enslaved Africans, let me use the proper word, right? And they, you know, ran away from, you know, the colonizers on their island or in their country excuse me, and um, they formed these <clears throat> autonomous societies in the mountainous region. I mean, I'll use Jamaica as an example, in like in, in Jamaica and the British, um, the British, you know, fought against the Maroons to the point where, you know, the Maroons were successful enough where they formed a treaty with England, right? Now, this is the part, but it's the hard truth, you know, in that treaty, um, the, the Maroons agreed to, you know, return any um, captured enslaved Africans who ran away from the British um, territory or colony. Um, mm -hmm. I did not know that. Yeah, you know, a lot of the times when we have victories against the Europeans, we beat them one or two times, but we haven't won, we won the battle, but we didn't really necessarily win the war, right? So even like in the Haitian Revolution, you see, okay, yeah, they beat the French, and the British and the Spanish that all ganged up on them and they chased them away. But then France just kept threatening to reinvade and reinvade and reinvade. And the Haitian leaders, Dessalines and, and those generals were smart enough to know that we can't fight this 13 war year again. Like we beat them once and that's good enough, but we're, we're still not, we're still a new nation at this point. So we're not powerful enough to keep fighting, keep fighting. And that's why France was able to impose those taxes about you know, um, lost revenue for, you know, like you beat them in a fight and then you still have to pay them back for winning the fight. Mm -hmm. And again, so that's kind of like what happened with the Maroons and the Treaty of the Leeward Islands and the Windward Island Maroons. They beat out, they beat the British, formed their own um, encampments in different parts of the island, but then had to form a treaty saying, you know, if anybody else tried to do what we do, we'll send them back to you. That's the hard truth, you know what I'm saying? Wow. So um, in Jamaica, some of the most popular Maroons were Queen Nanny and Captain Cujo. They were siblings. And, um, and um, Jamaica still has towns called um, Nanny Town, named after Queen Nanny. They have another town called Akampong, 
which is the mm -hmm. same name of a town in Ghana. So, you know, some of the slaves who were in Jamaica came from Ghana and they named, it was so important to them that they named one of their new free towns after one of their old hometowns, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the Jamaican Maroons are some of the more famous ones. Queen Nanny can be found on the Jamaican $500 bill. Um, but oh, wow. I also included in here Dutty Bookman. He's the guy in the middle. And Dutty Bookman, I think, is really special because he was, he was brought from Senegambia region in Africa, West Africa. They brought him to Jamaica. They enslaved him. And he was such an unruly slave, a maroon at heart, that the British couldn't deal with him and they sent him to Haiti, something that they did with um, people who were rebellious slaves on, the, on Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And Dutty Bookman went to Haiti and basically immediately hooked up with all the rebellious um, Haitians on the island and he became a voodoo priest and he was using spiritual warfare, right? Mm -hmm. To um, attack um, the French. And, you know, Dutty Buckman, uh, you know, the stories mm -hmm. know that, you know, he would lead the Haitian people into swamps to kind of do their planning for the war and stuff because they knew that the French were never coming into the swamps that had alligators and a bunch of wild animals. So again, it just shows how the African people brought the knowledge of being one with the earth and one with the land one with animals, you know what I'm saying? You know, we didn't, we don't um, just, in Africa, they don't just kill animals just for the sake of killing them, you know, um, like the way the white people like to go there and hunt and then pose with the dead lion, you know. When we killed an animal, it was for food. And then we used every part of the animal, just the way the Native American used the bison, right? When they kill the bison, it's food. Um, they take the hide for skin, they make their teepees with it. They like, they, um, they use the, the horns and it's for, for tools and everything. So they honor the animal by using all parts of the animal, right? And you'll see indigenous peoples around the world doing that. They colonize <laughs> so much, right? So Buckman was one of those um, guys who really like stirred up people, use spiritual warfare to, um, um, to, to get the Haitian people to unite. And his, the reason his name is Buckman is because he was also, he was well-read and he also taught, um, the Haitians how to read. So, you know, that is why they gave him that moniker Bookman, right? And the French captured him and they killed him. I think they burned him alive, right? That's what they did at the time. And he died in 1791. And guess what year the Haitian Revolution began? 1791. So a lot of times you see in, in history, men, great men and women who, um, who fought for freedom, fought for people, were the spark, you know? That's were nice. the spark that ignited certain revolutions. And I think Dutty Buckman is a good example of that. Um, the other mm -hmm. gentleman there next to him is Francois Macandal, another Haitian. Oh, yes. <laughs> another Haitian who was brought, I, I feel like he was also from this, um, the Senegal region. I'm, I know it's West Africa, but I want to say it's Senegal. that he also came from as a slave to Haiti, right? And um, Macandal is a great example of, of, of being one with, with the earth because he is in about 1750, so about 40 years before the Haitian Revolution, he started to poison Frenchmen, right? And start his own revolution. And he used the herbs and the plants and his knowledge of the different plants on the island to start poisoning Frenchmen. But what he did first was poison black collaborators. Mm -hmm. So all the people that he knew, you know, uh, you know, in America, we would call them house ninjas, right? So all those people that he knew would sell out the movement, he killed them first. And, you know, I know that might sound controversial, but if you check any revolution, there's always a story of having to kill your own people so that they don't sell you up. Because what happens is that some people are still on the teeth of the oppressor. That's and, right. you know, they're not, they're willing to sacrifice all of you just for their own personal gain or their own, a better life for them specifically. You got to get rid of them. I mean, it, it, it is what it is, right? It so is what it is. is. Yeah, so he poisoned black collaborators first and um, then went on and moved on to poisoning the French. And he was teaching the Haitian people how to use the herbs and the, the fauna and different things, the flora found on the, um, on the island and how to use that to advantage. And he was able to do that. Of course, he was on the run while doing it, right? So in a way, he's like the first Maroon in Haiti 
And um, they caught him after about eight years, and they also burned him um, at the stake. And it's funny because there's a story that said, like, before they, they set the fire, he said, I'm going to come back as a mosquito. And everybody's like, what? Like, a mosquito? Like, that's an odd thing for somebody to say when they're about to be killed, right? And a mosquito, when you think of a mosquito, it's a very small, tiny, puny little thing. Like, what is that going to do? But mosquitoes carry disease. You see what I'm saying? And then later on in the years, um, a lot of the French soldiers died from malaria and dengue fever and a lot of the diseases that, um, that the mosquitoes carried, right? But um, Macandal knew and understood which were the, the herbs and plants that he could use that could counteract those kinds of things, right? So people said spiritually, when he said that mosquitoes, like, oh, he was basically telling us, don't worry, I'm going to come back as a mosquito and I'm going to kill off some of the French people for you, right? So you know, that's one of the legends about um, Macandal. But I would say he's the forefather and the precursor to Dutty Buckman. And then we have Zumbi, right? Ooh. Zumbi is Zumbi dos Palmares from Brazil. Brazil. And his <laughs> uncle was Ganga Zumba, right? And Ganga Zumba was um, basically a Yoruba king in Brazil. So these, these Maroons, right? Um, these African people that were brought from like the Angola region to Brazil, they ran away. They fought against the um, Portuguese. You know, Brazil is known for their rainforest. Plenty of places to hide, right? They formed their own um, communities called quilombos, yeah, right? Yeah. And, and it was, and you have to understand, these are not like 25, 50. These are thousands of African people that, that were escaped the Portuguese and formed these communities. And the quilombos were considered, it was considered a Yoruba kingdom. This man was a Yoruba king. So it's like setting up their own African kingdom in the new world, right? Mm -hmm. And they were really su um, successful. And when, um, after um, Z Ganga Zumba died, his nephew, um, Zumbi, he, um, you know, kind of grabbed the reins and he became actually the last Yoruba king, the last king of the Colombos mm -hmm. in Brazil. And Zumbi means ghost. So, you know, the idea is that he was able to fight the, the Portuguese and then disappear and have his forces disappear into the jungles and into the forests of Brazil and not be captured. So that is, and that Zumbi, that name is, you know, comes from the West African regions, right? And it's interesting because in Trinidad, we say Jumbi and Jumbi means ghost. We have Moko Jumbi. Those are the, like the stilt walkers. You see the people walking on, on the high stilts. And then they have these masks and these different costumes. And the idea is that they're ghosts. So you're only still to represent that you're high up and you're flying, right? And then in Jamaica, they use the word duppy, right? And duppy means ghost, right? And in mm. Haiti, they use zombie. And we know what zombies are in, how they use it in traditional Western um, media and, you know, iconography, right? Yeah. So you have zombie, jumbi, duppy, and zombie. All meaning ghosts. Listen to the the lexicon, right? Listen to the how they sound. They're all similar words, and these are these are words that couldn't be translated, right? Mm -hmm. They're they words that have, have lasted time. You know, even when Drake had the beef with um, Pusha T, he called his his freestyle "Duppy Freestyle," and it was so oh, interesting to me yeah. because yeah, because uh, a lot of Americans, obviously, who are fans of hip hop, were like, "What the hell is he talking about, Duppy? What?" And, you know, just hearing them pronounce it was kind of funny, too, as a Caribbean <laughs> person. But J Drake is from Toronto, where there's a huge Caribbean um, population. That's and, right. Yeah. And it really infiltrates the regular Canadian society, just where the Jamaican um, um, culture infiltrates London society, you know? So the average Black British guy, whether he has Caribbean roots or not, he uses Jamaicans, they use Jamaican slang, man's damn, wag, wag, right? You understand? Yeah. And so when Drake uses the word um, duppy freestyle, he's basically saying, yo, pusher, you're a dead man. Right? <laughs> that, that's, that's what he's saying. Like, I killed you already. I named the freestyle duppy freestyle. You're already a ghost. <laughs> So there's that's so much, so, you know, that's some our, perspective for the our audience to, for, to wrap yeah, their minds around. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's just so interesting the way there's this overlap. I mean, you could talk from West, the, from the word being coming from West Africa, 
to Jamaica. Jamaica's going to Toronto, influencing them, and they're the greatest Toronto rapper ever to live, using it to um, just an, a, a, I'm an American. And part of what I think is Drake, Drake's genius in that is that he knows that Pusha T would have to go look that word up. <laughs> Pusha T is from Virginia. I mean, yeah, Jamaicans are everywhere, but that's not something that, you know, I live in the D.C. area, so I know, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's not Caribbean culture hasn't influenced the D.C. area in the way where the average Black people are walking around using Caribbean lingo. It's just not mm -hmm. a thing, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that it was Drake's genius of kind of like one up in Pusha T in a way by I'm using something that you don't even know, but yet I'm still hitting it on the target. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. So, you know, I didn't mean to stray off, but, you know. No, I, 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 I think that's the beauty in wrapping your message in your culture, mm -hmm. especially um, for people who may be a, a little bit outside of that culture. You know, mm -hmm. just, just even with what you said, I mean, that clears up so much, uh, you know, lack of knowledge in the mm -hmm. community because there are lots of things that, you know, people consume, whether it's, um, musical entertainment or things from you know that's produced by Hollywood mm -hmm. and you don't know the connections that are directly to the culture and the diaspora I mean even the fact that the group Maroon 5 um I I highly doubt they didn't know what the term Maroon meant yeah, you know what absolutely. I mean Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, like, I, I want folks to understand, like, you're kind of highlighting Caribbean history and, um, mm -hmm. but you're also highlighting history that's a part of the Americas in and of itself. Mm -hmm. You know, these are colonies that were located all throughout the Americas. And that, that part of the story of our people is often not told. So